Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Panosian and the ARPA Institute uh, for this invitation. I'm really grateful um, to, for the opportunity to have a platform to share part of my research with you. Um, I thank you all for attending, um, and I look forward to our conversation after the talk. My initial entry to Armenian studies centered on a group of orphaned writers who gathered in Paris in the years following World War I. And as I researched the group that called themselves Mank in periodicals of that time, I was struck by the absence of the word diaspora and was fascinated by the diverse formulations that referred to the post-genocide dispersion. And, and I've listed, I don't know how well you can see the slides back here, but I've listed a few that I would encounter. Um, and the, as, a, as a diasporan who had grown up in the structures, frameworks, and institutions of the diaspora, this struck me as, as quite interesting. So we would have, I would come across terms like Tirka Hayachun, Sirvat Hayachun, the dispersed, Kavuta Hayachun, community Armenians, Kavta Hayachun, migrant Armenians, Ardasa Hani Hayachun, Armenians abroad that were um, formulations that you know, referred to the, the, the concept of diaspora that I already had in, in my mind. I noticed that the word began circulating only in the 1940s and wondered if there had been a concerted effort to adopt the term as a means of describing the Armenian experience. What was also interesting was that parallel with the solidification of this term diaspora, um, the diaspora's intellectual center shifted from western cities to the Middle East. And in the process, the literary outlook of Mank and similar groups of the time were overlooked by efforts of canon formation that now got underway in the Middle East. The project that I'll be presenting today, in many ways, is an attempt to address these two concerns or inquiries. I'll be discussing a rare moment of transition, reflection, and organized planning that writers of the diaspora undertook as its intellectual center shifted from Paris to the Middle East during the years following World War II. I believe that the story I'm going to tell of two rival conferences are quite telling in this regard. I argue that the second Congress of the Soviet Armenian Writers Union, held in Yerevan in 1946 for a select group of diaspora writers, and a reactionary conference organized by the Writers' Association of Syria and Lebanon, held in Ishtora, Lebanon in 1948, served to launch a new body of literature that now explicitly called itself Literature of the Armenian Diaspora and helped shape its grand narrative. In September of 1946, eight diaspora writers, Gara Ben Sidal from the States, Levon Mesrob and Zare Horkuni from France, Vahe Vahian and Hovanes Arbashian from Lebanon, Sempa Derunian from Cyprus, and Hai Karakash and Aram Yeremian from Iran, journeyed to the emergent capital of Soviet Armenia to participate in the second Congress of the Soviet Armenian Writers' Union as invited guests. And, and here we can see um, the diaspora participants with um, Abed Giza Agyan in the center of that picture. These, these select writers who participated in the Congress with no official representative authority savored the inv invitation mostly on a personal level as a rare opportunity to rest their exiled feet on their people's soil and to validate their contribution to a national literary tradition. Among invited intellectuals from various diaspora communities the decision of Avediki Sahagyan, then president of the Writers' Union, to extend an invitation to diaspora writers elicited mixed voices and uproar. Pro-Soviet publications immediately applauded the unprecedented inclusion of diaspora writers in the momentous gathering that was to discuss the state and future of Armenian literature at large. Further, they viewed the invitation as an initial step in the establishment of open relations between Soviet Armenia and the diaspora, directly coinciding with the, great, with the greater plans for repatriation already underway during those years. Anti-Soviet publications, predominantly affiliated directly or indirectly with the Tashnak party, 
harshly criticized the invitation for imposing strictly ideological preconditions. They branded many of the invited writers second rate and claimed that they had been chosen simply for their pro-Soviet attitudes. Most importantly, they argued that Soviet Armenia's gesture constituted a political formality of false pretense, ultimately designed to deny representational voice to the diaspora and exclude Western Armenian language and culture from processes of nation building. Amidst the polarized debate, others still, such as Ashak Chovanyan of the Parisian Review Anahid, were reluctant to either applaud or criticize. While agreeing with and commending the writers' union's gesture on principle, Chovanyan remained skeptical of productive results and awaited the long-term outcome of diaspora homeland relations by directing his anticipatory breath towards Soviet Armenia. Indeed, the historical moment surrounding the Second Congress was expectant with possibilities that could shape or reshape the collective identities of Armenians living both in Soviet Armenia and in diaspora communities. The Second World War and the Soviet Union's triumph over the Nazi invasion occasioned Armenia's renewed belief in the Soviet order, a patriotic sentiment that was also shared by many nationalist Armenians abroad who now embrace Soviet Armenia as a permanent homeland and thus a place for desired return. Furthermore, the Soviet claims Sagars and Ardahan and the ensuing process of repatriation launched in 1945 and welcomed across political party lines in diaspora communities infused Soviet Armenia with a new sense of nationalism that, on the one hand, highlighted and affirmed the quality of salvation attributed to the Soviet project, and on the other hand, explicitly bound a defined plot of Armenian land to the concept of homeland. Simultaneously, in offering some diaspora Armenians a release from exilic life, the repatriation helped to consolidate the remaining dispersed communities into a single entity that self-reflexively began referring to itself as the diaspora, in direct relation to either Soviet Armenia or an imagined greater Armenia. The consolidation of diasporic Armenian populations following World War II also had a literary counterpart. Although Armenian intellectuals continued to gather around publications in various cities across the world, the predominant post-World War I intellectual scene shifted from Paris to the Middle East, where Cairo, Aleppo, and mainly Beirut began to take center stage as the hub of diaspora's intellectual discourse and literary production. As the threat of assimilation became a daunting reality for Armenian communities in Western countries, political parties in the Middle East worked toward constructing social and educational structures that sought to preserve the language. These newfound educational institutions made a concerted effort to standardize and revivify the Western Armenian linguistic form. In addition to standardization efforts in Armenian day schools, a political campaign designed to prohibit the use of Turkish in colloquial speech within the refugee population was also adopted by community organizations. Ultimately, both endeavors forged a linguistically homogenous group out of a culturally diverse population. Within a few decades, re regional dialects and Turkish colloquial speech gave way to a standard Western Armenian that was based on the pre-1915 Constantinople or Bolis uh, variant. In due course, Beirut and Aleppo, with their publishing houses, emerged as centers of production for textbooks, journals, and literature that cultivated the new standard. Thus, it should come as no surprise that the debate over affiliation and belonging, instigated by the 1946 Congress of the Soviet Armenian Writers' Union, revolved around the, language, the issue of language. While the controversy might appear simply to mirror political alignments and ideological arguments, the central debate that emerged from the Second Congress was about the fate of the Western Armenian linguistic form. The debate that developed in the diaspora's journals was inspired by Congress's treatment of diaspora literature as a subsidiary to Soviet Armenian literature. 
Abe Vikisa Hagian's opening remarks promptly claimed that the Congress's most valuable outcome would be the strengthening of relations between literature of the homeland and literature of the diaspora. In order to explain how this projected goal should translate to tangible action by writers of the diaspora, he pronounced a phrase, mi kragan tun mi one literature is one people, if we were to literally translate it, which subsequently became the dictum of his speech to be used, reproduced, translated, and mistranslated by diaspora journals as one literature, one nation, one literature, one language, and so on. In fact, Isaac Yan's phrase was meant to explain the cultural and historical significance of literature's representational value. In other words, it implies that literature is the representation of its people. As such, the phrase serves as the preamble to his overview of the history of Armenian literature, in which he links the Eastern Armenian literary tradition of Soviet Armenian literature, which in turn he fundamentally subordinates to what he calls the greatest and most progressive literature of the world, that of the Soviet Union. In calling for the perpetuation of socialist realism, a literary approach in which works propagate Soviet ideology, Isaagian turns to military language and ident identifies Soviet Armenian literature as a, a chogat, a, a detachment of Soviet literature, and names diaspora writers as zinagits, comrades in arms of that unit. He tasks the diaspora writer with what he refers to as a holy obligation to sing the praise of Soviet Armenia as the only homeland for Armenians and to ensure the success of repatriation through his or her written word. He says, they shall serve as a bridge in order to spread the cultural, artistic, and literary wealth of Soviet Armenia and to create a unified literature around Soviet Armenian literature. In many respects, the hierarchy outlined by Isahakian in his opening remarks provided the overall structure for the first series of reports presented at the Congress. The overarching direction of literary production was dictated by the report on Soviet literature presented earlier that month at the meeting of Soviet Writers Union in Leningrad and prepared by Andrei Zhdanov who had just been appointment, uh, appointed by Stalin to direct the Soviet Union's cultural policy, and who was also present at the Congress in Yerevan. The outgoing secretary of the Soviet Armenian Writers Union, Hrachia Krikorian, presented a report on Soviet Armenian literature and its paths for future development, and Edward Topjian, a Yerevan native, presented the report on diaspora's contemporary Armenian literature. While the diaspora invite invitees were allocated 15 minutes each to present their views on Armenian literature of their regions, Topjian's report served as the official stance of the Writers, Union, the, the Writers' Union on Diaspora Literature. Denying the diaspora any possibility for artistic creation in exile, Topjian's report says, over the last 30 years, the Armenian people who were who were uprooted from their fatherland, passed through the roads of suffering and bore countless grievances and deprivation. Artistic literature shared the people's fate, bearing the deadly stamp of alienation. He then presents a number of French Armenian and American Armenian writers within the framework of assimilation's threat, and criticizes others such as Levon Shant, Hago Poshakan, and Hamaster for their nationalistic approach of looking backward at history rather than forward to the future as inspiration for their writing. Topjan concludes his report by recommending that diaspora literature consider nurturing the concept of return and the building of a socialist homeland as its sole trajectory. Otherwise, he sees no future and only death in and demise, a verdict that he is not reluctant to express explicitly, as he says, this literature, which is detached from its homeland and its people, has no prospect for development. True art can flourish only if it is intimately fused with its motherland and its people.
Implicit in Topchian's dismissal of art in exile is the narrow limitation of the Armenian people to those living on Armenian lands. But more importantly, similar to Isagian's call to build literature around Soviet Armenian literature, it completely omits the Western Armenian literary tradition from the establishment of this unified sense of Armenian literature. The invited diaspora writers at Congress were not quick to raise issue with the Western Armenian language, uh, the issue of Western Armenian language and literature. Overwhelmed by feelings of homecoming, they embraced the ideal of oneness and unity. In the many articles that Vahe Vahian penned in his journal Ani upon his return to Beirut, he reiterates Isahagian's dictum and affirms Top Topjian's dismissal of art in exile. He, he writes, until the complete realization of the ideal, one people and one literature, joined together on the fatherland, the only force of existence for, our, existence for our literature that has been imbued with the fate of exile can sprout from our mother country, our people, and a deep, unconditional, and holy communication with its culture. There you have it. This is the faith and direction for those who believe in the Armenian spirit. Um, I should also note that Vahe Vahian uh, wrote a travel log, a memoir of sorts of his travels, entitled Haradez Neru Hashtutuna, The Reconciliation of Ar Aradez. He published that in his journal, uh, journal Ani in 1947, then uh, it came out in book form in 1953. Um, and similarly, the, the French novelist Zare Vorpuni published a, a travel memoir um, entitled Tebi Yergir, Toward Homeland, and he published that in 1948. Um, and both of these memoirs echo similar uh, sentiments. Other diaspora writers, on the other hand, responded in an uproar following the release and publication of Isa Hakian's speech and uh, Topjan, Topjan's report presented at the Congress. As expected, the political party affiliations of intellectuals and journals dictated the general nature of their responses. Yet interestingly, the arguments presented had less to do with political ideology in, in, for, in the form of praising or bashing the Soviet order than with language and literary tradition. The articles published in Hyrenik Monthly and the Aleppo-based um, Nairi treat Topjan's report as a direct attack on Western Armenian, which they more frequently refer to as Turka Ayaren, Turkish Armenian. In, in an article entitled, The Soviet Armenian Writers, Congress, and Us, Minas Tadalyan, under the pen name Armen Amadian, introduces a new voca vocabulary, Mayrenik, um, motherland, which he claims signifies language, in opposi opposition to Hayrenik, fatherland signifying soil. Whereas in Armenian, language often referred to as mother tongue is always used in a fe as a feminine concept. Here, it is rendered as equivalent to the masculine land. Furthermore, to Lilian, the little Soviet Armenia's appreciation of language as a repository of the national spirit and argues that unlike Soviet Armenians, diaspora Armenians have understood and embraced the limits of language as a direct result of the threat of assimilation. In fact, the idea of language, and more specifically Western Armenian, serving as homeland in exile was not new. It had been celebrated by the Parisian group of writers that I mentioned before in the uh, early 1930s, and who used it to cultivate the concept of little Armenias. These writers sought to rethink exile as a productive space and to testify to their experience of the aftermath of genocide rather than narrating the events of the past. In doing so, they believed themselves to be launching Armenian literature anew in exile and thus symbolically regrouping the dispersed through language. However, when intellectuals from the Middle East revisited the idea of language as home, the concept was fashioned as a building block for diaspora's nationalist narrative of return that emerged in the years following World War II. Within this new paradigm, Western Armenian language was celebrated not as a dynamic offspring of diasporic life, 
but rather as a golden emblem of the past to be guarded and preserved for an eventual return. Although diaspora periodicals sympathetic to the Tashnak party generally shared to the Yan's outrage about the 1946 Congress, Congress's stamping of Western Armenian literature with, with an expiration date, diaspora communities awakening to the need for language revitalization spread across party lines. Subsequently, the enormity of the task highlighted the need for organizations networked across diaspora communities. Under this rubric, Naidi's editorial team, led by Antranik Tsarukyan, initiated an effort to form an organized collective of diaspora intellectuals by proposing the establishment of a writer's association centered in the Middle East. Although the actual outcome fell short of the desired grand vision, the initiative produced a discourse that enabled the imagining of a transnationally networked Armenian diaspora, an image that resolutely survived for some decades to come. So now let's take a look at what this association uh, in the Middle East produced, the, the, the rival conference, although they claimed not, uh, for it not to be um, in reaction to 1946 Congress. The 46th Congress's dismissal and critique of Western Armenian linguistic form was translated as an attempt to silence the diaspora, thus incited discussions about the need to create a forum that would allow diaspora voices to speak. Most notably, developing in the pages of Naidi, the argument that diaspora intellectuals began to raise was founded on the principle that they had the right to protect their literary autonomy. A series of articles, including Edward Boyajian's Uhima Madadzeng, Let's Begin to Think, focused on the 1946 Congress's mandate that diaspora literature serve the Soviet project and claimed that artistic expression cannot and should not be used for propaganda. Soon, Antsanik Zarugyan began to publish editorials, uh, yes, editorials calling for a conference of writers in dispersion. The two main goals of the conference were outlined, the projected conference, were outlined as the creation, one, of a writers' union that links together writers of the diaspora from various communities, and two, a well-established publishing house in a luminous center. Naidi's editorials are accompanied by excerpts of letters from various diaspora writers stating their enthusiasm for the idea of a conference. This list of supporters includes Kostan Zarian, Hamaste, Adam Haigaz, Simon Brazian from the States, Shavash Misakian, Nigo Osarafian from France, and Vahan Navasartian, Pulkem Mkhitaryan, and Benjamin Tashian from Egypt. Most see a diaspora gathering as a necessary response to Soviet Armenian Writers' Union Congress and, it, and its attempt to speak for the diaspora. The writer Seza is quoted as saying, after the Soviet Armenian Writers' Congress, the Congress, a conference for Armenian community writers is a reasonable consequence but not necessarily a rival event. The ignored Armenian intellectuals living abroad are obliged to speak for themselves, and more importantly, to showcase their work. While she echoes sentiments similar to those of the other supporters mentioned, she warns against framing the gathering as a rival conference, for such a framing may undermine the very aim of the diaspora to speak and to act autonomously. Although hosting the forum where the momentum gathered for a diaspora conference, Naidi did not seek to organize the event, and instead called on the Mkhitaryist congregation of Venice or the Armenian Educational and Cultural Society, Hamaskain, to take the reins in the organizational efforts. Naidi's announcements were met with an uproar in the press from various communities. While pa uh, Paris's Harach, Boston's Haidenik, Cairo's Husafed, and Beirut's Astarar and Astag encouraged the idea, other newspapers more loyal to Soviet Armenia, such as Beirut's Yorobutitsang and Ararat or Cairo's Arev, harshly critiqued Nairi's efforts as an anti-Armenian propaganda organized by Tashnak leaders. <laughs> 
Amidst this polarized response, no existing diaspora institution volunteered to take on the organizational effort, resulting in the establishment of a new association created solely to organize a pan-community diaspora Armenian writers' conference. Meeting, meeting in Ishtora, Lebanon on August 10, 1947, a group of Armenian writers and intellectuals from Syria and Lebanon laid the foundations for the Association of Armenian Writers of Syria and Lebanon and elected as their executive body Nigol Akhbalian, Antranik Zarukian, Garo Sasuni, Musha Rishan, Armen Anush, and Edward Boyajian. Um, we can see in, in the following two slides, these are just caricature illustrations published in Naidi. Um, in this first one, this is the, the, it highlights this new association uh, born to, uh, to, to put together this Congress. Um, clockwise from the top, we see Musha Rishan, um, Armen Anush, uh, Garo Sasuni, and here on the, on the drums, um, Antranik Zarubian. And another one in the following month's journal, um, again, um, caricaturing the, the organizers uh, in both their call and announcement to gather together uh, those dispersed intellectuals um, uh, living across communities and also the, um, the, the implicit sort of uh, uh, commentary addressed to, to Soviet Armenia. Due to the lack of resources and the regional turmoil caused by the 1948 war in Palestine, the association fell short of organizing a diaspora Armenian writers conference. Instead, it organized a Middle Eastern Armenian writers conference to serve as a stepping stone, or this is what they aimed to do, a stepping stone for this still-desired pan-community gathering, um, that which, which never really took place. This is the, the, the announcement. This is the call for papers, call for writers to, to partake in this, um, in this conference. So following this open invitation um, in, um, in the newspapers, the Middle Eastern Writers' Conference took place on September 18 through the 20th, 1948 in Ishtora, Lebanon, with attendees mostly from Syria and Lebanon. Vahe Oshagan was present from Palestine, Armen Garone arrived late from Tehran, and the two scheduled delegates from Egypt were unable to make it all together. Despite its intended grand scope of reaching diaspora writers across party lines, the 1948 conference ended up principally gathering writers affiliated with the Tashnak party. The conference's three-day agenda consisted of the following seven presentation topics. Armenian prose in the diaspora, delivered by Edward Boyajian. Armenian drama in the diaspora by uh, Bahe Oshagan. Diaspora's Armenian Press by Minas Talilian, Issues Concerning the Armenian Language by Edward Daronian, <coughs> Poetry in the Diaspora by Musha Rishan, Diaspora and Armenian Literature's Trajectory by Garo Sasuni, Soviet Armenian Literature by Antrani Tsarulian. In his opening remarks, Garo Sasuni, the elected chair of the meeting, highlighted the conference's aim as being in the service or protection of uh, Armenian language and literature, implying the recognition of an impending threat to, the, to these two realms as the impetus for the gathering. During the course of the conference, several discussions explicitly addressed the question of terminology and definition with respect to the word diaspora, and finally reaching the consensus that that which we term diaspora literature is the continuation of Western Armenian literature. We call diaspora literature works that have been informed by our dispersion. Here the, the participants are uh, drawing a clear thread that connects the pre-1915 Western Armenian literary tradition which was centered in, in Constantinople, to the scattered collection of works published in the years following the genocide across Armenian communities. Furthermore, they excluded the works of the surviving generation from this definition, 
So the works of Gostan Zarian and Havel Boshagan from, it was excluded from the um, um, diaspora literature um, and, and claimed that only works informed and formed by the experience of dispersion constituted this new category. Standing in the wake of World War II, the conference participants enjoyed a unique vantage point from which to evaluate the preceding decades. Using the two world wars as markers, the participants reconceptualized Western Armenian literary tradition within a measurable framework. In surveying three decades of post-1915 literary and linguistic progress, they realized the potential of producing literature and dispersion on one hand, and turned toward a rhetoric of self-preservation on the other. The realization of potential, coupled with the recognition of the threat of linguistic assimilation, prompted the initiation of project ideas aimed at safeguarding tradition. Here, the threat of linguistic assimilation was recognized as coming from multiple directions. The United States and Europe were frequently brought up as examples of spaces that hindered the linguistic development of immigrant communities and validated the shift of the intellectual center from Paris to the Middle East. Furthermore, Soviet Armenia's orthography reforms and the Writers' Union position um, in the 1946 Congress were seen as similarly viable threats that endangered continuity of the Western Armenian literary tradition. Um, and, and just to, if I, I'm just going to add a, a, a few words here. This is precisely what marks the, 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 the ship in terms of character of what is coming out and the discourse that's coming out following World War II and um, what, uh, what, what, was, what we saw coming out uh, after World War I in, in, in a place like Paris, for instance, um, where, you, where you saw or where, where we have a flurry of intellectual, literary, and artistic activity um, and in the announcements and, and the descriptions of their platform, uh, of you know, in the inaugural issues of the journals that they publish, these writers and artists were uh, recognized their position not as a connecting thread to the past, but as something new, um, something more sort of that that erupted from their position in exile, um, and they saw that a little bit more uh, positively, optimistically. Than, um, the, than, than what we see here, where we see exile um, coupled with or synonymous with threat, threat of assimilation, and therefore prompting uh, a language of safeguarding, uh, protecting what came before rather than cultivating something new. Um, to live on now, in, the, in this case, under the pen name Van Antian, went as far as to claim that the Soviet Armenian Writers' Congress was nothing more than an assassination effort targeted toward the literature of immigrant communities. Not all Armenian intellectuals of the Middle East agreed with the conference's assessment of Western Armenian literature. Writing in the Rangavar Party's Beirut-based newspaper Baikar, Puzant Yerlyayan offered a divergent perspective on, di on diaspora literature, uh, which he does not characterize as an extension of the pre-1915 Constantinople brand. Similarly, using the two world wars as markers, Yerlyayan envisions diaspora literature as a category of its own, consisting of sparse attempts that never achieve literary greatness, but nevertheless give representation to the experience of the catastrophe's aftermath. For Yeryayan, post-1915 Western Armenian literature fails to produce works that are relevant to the aesthetic movements of the time, suffers from lack of an intellectual center, though he gives credit to Paris for trying to be one, and um, he says, strays from preserving Armenian values within its content. Here's a quote from um, his article. Uh, Living far from the fatherland, the diaspora was forced to set root on foreign soil, and its literature successively began to echo those foreign environments. Believing 
that a literary tradition cannot flourish beyond a certain point without being grounded in its own land, he highlights the need to look towards Soviet Armenia as Western Armenian literature's only sal salvation. In other words, he recognizes the literary ventures made between the wars, but cannot see a future for them in the new post-World War II era. Tolevian's conference presentation reverses the critique of Western Armenian as a language incapable of sustaining itself in exile that was delivered in the 1946 um, conference. In fact, he presents the Eastern Armenian of Soviet Armenia as endangered, substantiating the need for language pre preservation in the diaspora as a principled pan-national cause, albeit centered in the Middle East. He makes a case for ensuring Western Armenians' longevity to serve a broader political agenda, which he relates as such. One day, if we gather in our fatherland, perhaps our languages will become one. The unrecognizable state of Soviet Armenian language forces us to care for our language, so that one day we may offer the necessary antidote. All the presenters saw the need to centralize the diaspora in order to ensure the survival and cultivation of their respective artistic genres. And Syria and Lebanon indirectly emerged as the implied possible centers. Vahe Oshagan, for instance, proposed the formation of a central committee to organize a traveling theater troupe to prepare an annual list of productions to guarantee financial resources and to reward talent. Boyajan stressed the importance of creating a network for exchange among diaspora writers by establishing a writers association. Tolilion emphasized the need for larger publishing houses that could secure a broader diasporic circulation of works. Daronian called for the preparation of Armenian language textbooks that could be used across communities and could allow for the standardization of the Western Armenian language. At the core of all the pre their presentations lay a concern regarding the public. Many <coughs> presentations explicitly addressed the need to cultivate a reading and viewing public. In other words, the writers saw the building of a diasporic society that would support the arts and that, in turn, the arts would represent as the fund fundamental task at hand. Their proposed projects that sought to organize and institutionalize literary, linguistic, and artistic production aim to serve this purpose of constructing an environment where art could be produced and subsequently received by a strong base of consumers. In many ways, these formative discussions conceived of Armenian diaspora literature and art similarly to the way a national literature is conceptualized, even though they are not produced in a territorially bound nation state. In his presentation, the poet and educator Musher Khan recognized the absurdity in conceiving of a transnationally spread Armenian communities uniformly, yet called for a clear articulation of what diaspora constitutes. He writes, it is necessary to clearly envision the immense and unique borders of, a, of diaspora's expanse. With the exception of the main fatherland, the entire globe can be considered diaspora. Such an extraordinary fate, and in particular, such an unnatural sight to comprehend and categorize all of that as a harmonious unified page in a people's history. This paradoxical need to contain diaspora within clearly defined terms while recognizing the impossibility of such an endeavor when considering the diversity of communities can be understood s simply as a need to center diaspora. In fact, the Middle East in general came forth as diaspora's cultural and literary center occasioned by the rival conferences of 1946 and 48 and the public debates that they produced. More specifically, Syria and particularly Lebanon emerged as spaces where language, liter literary production, and a grand narrative became institutionalized in the years and decades following World War II. 
In 1951, Antoni Tsarvian moved his literary monthly, Naidi, to Beirut, sharing the floor with Vahe Bahian's Ani. In the 1960s, Hamas Kain began to publish Pakin, and Simon Simonian established his Spirk, adding to the list of Beirut-based publications that shaped new forms of discussions about literature and culture in the diaspora. In addition, the educational policy of Lebanon allowed the Armenian community to develop an autonomous educational system, and Armenian day schools totaled 63 by 1958. Furthermore, by the end of the 1960s, higher education institutions in Lebanon, like Haigazian College, Hamaskain organized Palanjian College, and an established chair in St. Joseph University, began to offer specialized programs and degrees in Armenology. These frameworks of Armenian language training, alongside cultural organizations, publishing houses, and periodicals that allowed for intellectual exchange, created a climate for increased activity in the literary arts, establishing Beirut as the nucleus for the production and circulation of Western Armenian literature. <coughs> The Middle Eastern Armenian Writers Association 1948 conference claimed not to be a reaction to the 1946 Congress, but its attempt, attempts to preserve the autonomy of Western Armenian artistic expression in the face of threatened servitude to the Soviet project relegated artistic expression to a position of servitude to the diaspora project. The 1948 conference was not followed by subsequent gatherings, nor was the future ideal of a Diaspora Armenian Writers Association ever realized. But the legacy left behind was the forging of a homogenous diasporan cultural identity that became centralized in the Middle East, and we may say particularly in Beirut. These attempts to fashion diaspora as a homogenous entity contributed to the flourishing of intellectual and cultural activity, but did not allow for pluralism. Consequently, they produced problematic forms of cultural essentialism that proved detrimental to literary expression and production in the years to come, especially following Armenia's 1991 independence. As new diasporas have formed following the westward migration of Armenians from the Middle East and the mass exodus from the former Soviet Armenia and subsequently from the Republic of Armenia. Existing institutions and hermetically sealed narratives of the traditional diaspora cannot support the dynamic, pluralistic version of a new, diverse one. The depletion of Armenian communities in the Middle East is perhaps the main contributing factor to Western Armenians' current status as endangered, considering that sustainable models for linguistic and literary production do not exist in diaspora communities in the West. As these Western communities nevertheless burgeon alongside an emergent republic, it becomes imperative to recenter or perhaps altogether rethink the notion of center for diaspora's intellectual and literary production. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Uh, while uh, the conferences were being held, I can understand why everything was considered in the Armenian language. But um, subsequently, we were still in the diaspora, and uh, Armenian diaspora culture uh, also includes uh, creative work in other languages too. Should there be a uh, maybe a conference that would encompass the whole uh, creativity of diaspora uh, in any type of language. And I think to, to maybe amend that, that comment, I think even at the same time while this is happening, we have Armenian Americans and, and French right, Armenians which was course, not publishing, was. publishing in, in um, um, in French or, 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 or English, and, and some of whom uh, refer to or incorporate their experience of exile in, in their works. Um, there have been, you know, 
academic conferences that address the issue of language um, when we speak of um, Armenian literature. What con I mean, the, the question, the underlying question, as I take from your question, is what constitutes Armenian literature? Right. Um, I mean, that's, that's a, the big umbrella question. And then where do we fit things that are being produced in Eastern Armenian from Iran, from the Republic of Armenia and, and, and uh, elsewhere, um, Eastern Armenian from the states, where do we position Western Armenian coming from? I mean, absent in this is, is Bolis, Istanbul, today's Istanbul, who, who, who is not even sort of, um, doesn't take part in the conceptualization of diaspora, but they continue the literary tradition um, in their own right. Um, and then where do we also put foreign language uh, works, artistic works that, but where do we, this, this, is, this gets tricky. Where do we put uh, foreign language artistic works that what? What, is it just because they're written by an, you know, an IAN and Armenian that would make them uh, a work of, that speaks to the Armenian tradition or the Armenian experience? Or is it, do we look at content um, if it speaks to the experience of being Armenian in, the, in a diaspora setting, do we incorporate? Um, and and it's, it's this ambiguity that, um, that uh, m you know, sort of makes me shy away from uh, incorporating them in, in my discussion. Um, you, it, it's, it was probably apparent that I do have a, a keener interest in um, tracing the, the politics of, of Western Armenians' literary history, and, and this project is, is part of that endeavor. Um, what happened, so if we, if we start from modernization efforts in Constantinople of Western Armenian, um, what happens post this dispersion, um, and looking at the various branches of that particular tradition, and where we stand now. Um, that addressed it a bit. Other questions? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Thank you for your very insightful presentation. Uh, to what extent was the question of a, or a unified orthography uh, brought up at the at both conferences, 46 and 48? And then for the 48 conference, were Soviet Armenian writers invited? And and if so, did they did any choose to attend or did they all boycott? Um, I, I don't know about personal invitations. Um, so the, um, there was some coverage in Soviet Armenian press about the announcement that was put out, uh, but I don't know about direct invitations. There may have been, but uh, no, no participation, direct participation. And to go back to the orthography question, the orthography question um, in terms of the diaspora's you know, classical orthography um, is not part of the 1946 conference discussions. But it does become, uh, it does come up in, um, um, in, in in some of the discussions of the 48 conference, of course, um, as as seen as uh, particularly. So if you think about the quotation that I gave of Talilian, um, that is uh, that is referring to the the fate of Eastern Armenian. Um, uh, in that context, um, it, it's brought up. Uh, it's it's mainly it, it, it's mainly seen as a uh, move to uh, exclude once again uh, the diaspora. Well, has the large Armenian diaspora in Russia, for example, played any role in this at all? Do they still publish in, in Russian or things? Because we're not familiar about it. Here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I'm I'm not I don't special I don't know um, because I. In terms of, again, my my interest in my my training follows Western Armenian literary tradition. I don't specialize in, in, in Eastern, um, aside from its contact. Um, so I don't know about Russian language. There are plenty. I mean, it's a huge community. Of course, there are writers, um, but I I wouldn't be able to pull out examples for you. I don't know if anybody else not in it in, in the audience knows about the act, level of activity. Um, Particularly with Armenian language publications in Russia, I, I haven't I haven't come across any. Are, is there? Uh, 
Right, but uh, currently, in terms of, of, of publication know. in Armenian language, don't I don't school. know. They don't uh, have any any. Armenian school in Russia. Right, Russia. but there are current migrants that might write. Uh, I, I don't know uh, if there are Russian based, for instance, uh, immigrants who are publishing from publishing houses in Armenia, but they're uh, based in. In a Russian city, that's that's a po that's a possibility. But again, I don't. This is outside of my uh, particular area. Sorry. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, two questions. One is, what were the main issues that were discussed or brought forward in 1946 and 1948? What were the major topics? Uh, and a bit of discussion uh, and in what way can, can we compare with the issues that we have these days I don't know how much you're involved with, uh, with uh, Armenia's uh, writers are you, how, if, how, how much are you participating in Armenia today in your profession. But uh, comparing the major issues in 46 and 48, <coughs> let's put that as together. In what way they were different? And then what are the major issues that we can bring forward today? I mean, this is a lot of uh, a wider issue, but at least we should know, uh, have a feeling, like we talked about, uh, sort of uh, that Armenia, without having direct contact with the, with the country, we are, will not exist for long. But what were many of the, many of the other issues, important issues, that we can take examples as to how were they thinking at that time versus how we are thinking today? Um. Well, and there are scholarly projects that, that do take, take a look at literary trends and zero in at that particular period in, let's say, Soviet Armenian history. Um, and I can speak more directly to what is coming out of uh, the, the Middle East or Paris at the time. But if, you, if we, if we want to take a look at the, the, the conference, for instance, the 1946 Congress is, um, um, has only one agenda item allocated to discussing uh, the diaspora issue. And it may have come up elsewhere, but there, the some of the things on the agenda have to do with um, um, with form, aesthetic form, the aesthetics of literary production, um, and we can take a look to see what uh, was trendy, particularly with a you know looking through it from a lens of a Soviet um, uh, you know the context, of course, um, what, what was trendy at time. But there's a lot of discussion about form. Um, form, genre, stylistic issues related to, to, to writing, the sort of the, the nuts and bolts of, um, of what writing and literary production entails, um, also, uh, uh, along with evaluation of certain writers, etc. Um, the, the overarching um, uh, sort of um, the, the framework of literary production, as I mentioned, is socialist realism. Um, um, and there's quite a lot of propaganda talk in that regard that things need to follow and be produced within that umbrella. This is the 1946 Congress. And, and, and to, to just reiterate some of the things I said with regards to diaspora, the, the 1946 Congress, uh, the official report and what is stated by Isagyan and Topjan um, is that Western Armenia, uh, Western Armenian literature and literature of uh, not even Western Armenian, literature abroad um, cannot survive, does not have longevity, and as we see, it, if we take a look at its linguistic quality, it has fallen from where it was. And therefore, um, all diaspora writers need to be looking towards Soviet Armenia as home, um, and, and we need to start thinking about uh, art that can only be produced on Armenian soil. So art in exile is 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 is, is not uh, is presented as not being a viable possibility, um, and so the reactionary Congress in, in forty eight is cultivating art in exile, and um, the if if um, if socialist realism is the framework of nineteen forty six, 
uh, that's mandated on, on literary production. The ideological framework here in the 48 is this notion of preservation and safeguarding and protection and linking to the past um, and cultivating institutions, organizational networks, transnational networks um, that standardize Western Ar Armenian um, and allow artists to produce in Western Ar Armenian for the purpose of safeguarding. Um, if we then bring this together and try to connect it to the now, um, then we, we return to the title of my talk, the, the, the notion of the grand narrative that, that emerges as a result of this polarized discussion that the conferences cause. Um, and it, what, what, the, what the, these discussions bring forth, um, uh, or the, the narrative that emerges then, is that of return. Um, it, it's the narrative of return that is problematized, um, that also pushes forth the idea of homeland, which is the biggest, I think, problem term concept, has been the biggest, sort of the, the most problematic concept for, for diaspora uh, writers, regardless of where one falls um, in, in party lines, because it, uh, because it could be, it, it has so many references, right? It could be, at the time, Soviet Armenia. It could be an imagined uh, future Armenia, a unified Armenia. Um, and, um, and, and, and this is where the, the, the various, the polarized discussion begins. Um, but, um, but the term, the, the term diaspora that becomes more crystallized and solidified um, once again, to, to look back at this, this slide, all the terms that I mentioned or that I started the talk with, refer to scattering, right? They refer to a movement away from a place. Uh, the term diaspora, and this is, this is diaspora's narrative the, of becoming, refer, it, it refers to the, the movement in an opposite direction. Diaspora implies a return to a place, a return to a homeland. Um, and, and I think that's something we can think about from our current position um, as what these rival conferences occasioned and, and, the, and the debate that they brought forth. Sorry. Okay, so sorry I got here late, kind of finished my article, but having heard what I did here, um, an observation, a snarky remark, and then a substantive question. Uh, you're starting to sound a little bit like Valeo Shagan from the couple of classes I took, which is intriguing. Um, the snarky remark is, sounds like Terelian was prescient about the junky condition of Eastern Armenian, given what you hear conversationally coming out of Yerevan and environs these days. And the substantive question is, <coughs> taking off your scholar's hat and putting on your advocacy hat, where to next, what do you think, based on that which you've seen up to now in your researches, what would be your visceral, let's do this, if you had to come up with you know, a really compact couple of sentence statement. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll just take I your substantive question. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, if, if I were to put on, my, my, my advocacy hat, and I think that, that again, that comes clear. Uh, my personal investment, just, and, and, and this, this would vary uh, if we were to, to ask the same question to, to, to this group. Um, well, let, let me back up then. The, the answer to that question should be pluralistic, so that you know, everybody's investment here, and wherever they, they, they would like to, um, um, to put their, their resources and time to, should be valid. Um, so I, I would like to see, and I think it, it, it's, it's happening, uh, but I would like to see our formal institutions also going in this direction, where we don't try to see a homogenized notion of diaspora communities. Um, this, this oneness, uh, this, this, this trying to put everybody under the same kind of umbrella, um, and perhaps look at our diversity as, as something that we can tap into as resources, as, as, as richness. Again, my, my uh, personal sort of uh, advocacy hat is, is um, geared toward um, uh, cultivation efforts of Western Armenian. Um, and, and there are a number of, of, of scholars uh, that work to that end. 
in this in this room. Um, yeah. uh, I'm blown away, Carla. This was a very, very surprisingly very deep lecture that touched on I don't know how many issues, uh, but it's very interesting how you you picked up a couple of milestones in history and then use that as a frame. So first, thank you so much. Um, the frame was uh, very well done, uh, the framing of the issue. Um, what's interesting, I relate to a lot of the characters. Uh, I grew up with some of these characters and uh, I connected dots as you were talking, my early childhood in Egypt, then in Lebanon, etc. What's interesting, though, uh, and, and, and ending with this uh, with this graphic at the end, what I made up. I'm going to come to a question. I want to see your your point. What I made up from this arc of 150 years is that all of this activity, uh, you know, stemming from the Constantinople literary movement, you know, all the way to the post-genocide era, was some type of a uh, nationalism uh, driven, uh, triggered type of movement. And then post-1991, as you know, I remember Mushevich Khan and, and that, that, that way of unifying the diaspora. I mean, it, it rings very, very clearly in my head. Yepat Boyajian, etc. But then uh, we all saw what happened from 1991 onward, and now we have this notion of diasporas. My question to you, and I've been thinking about this issue for a long time now, have we as a collective, of, of, as, a, as a group of people on this planet, uh, kind of lived a period of, of nationhood or nationalism, and do you think this notion of diaspora is basically spreading again into ethnicity? So ethnicity is a very different concept and a very different, so gone are the socialism, realism, and all, you know, the, the, the diaspora's nationalism and, and all that. Ethnicity in a global world uh, it, uh, with, with this concept of diasporas, you know, you can do whatever you want, and wherever you want at any time with all these means of communications and, and transportation and fluidity in, in everything. It's a very different concept and changes the entire frame. Do you think, do you think this arc, uh, after all of this dynamic, that 150 year period was a very specific period because we were constrained in a certain time and space. Uh, this concept of diasporas, in my opinion, takes us into ethnicity which is a very different concept. I mean, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about how you're understanding or defining the concept of ethnicity from, from a, a, contemporary, um, a contemporary angle. Um, simply because if we are to look at um, earlier, pre-1915 discussions of nationalism, within Armenian intellectual circles, that the, the, the very concept of ethnicity is also um, uh, discussed um, in, in, in trying to come up with uh, definitions and terminology with which to talk about the people um, as, a, as a grouping. Um, so, um, and then I'm also thinking about ethnicity as a, um, from a current standpoint, as a very sort of, if we if we think about it as a post-colonial term, a Western term, then I wouldn't. Uh, I, I'm again hesitant to see it as sort of a, a mode of describing the current moment from an Armenian perspective. Um, but I, I think this is this is a really interesting uh, discussion. I, I, I define it more. I mean, there's a very famous piece of work. Uh, you know, imagine communities. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's along those lines. And then the way the word ethnicity for me, I am Parelbi Kordzazen, Menke, 
հավակագան աս եւ այլն մերոնքը ես որեխորը սրվան եւ այլն մենք նույն ճաշերը գտենք նույն ընդհանուր հավակագանության չափանիշը շատ տարբեր է մենքի եւ մերոնքի կամ ասքի so that that's my my lens of ethnicity so any type of literally work and literally fun within the context of meronk is much much more narrow within the context of diasporas becomes much much more narrow mm-hmm. um okay yeah so if, if my my entry way in what you're what you're saying would be the the notion of imagining um and the the, the imagined community which is even further more facilitated today than in the time that Anderson was writing right if if we are to think about the the digitally networked village the the global village um then then yes the diaspora becomes a a, a very different kind of possibility um a, a lot more real than it, it could have ever been and its diversity um is a lot more visible than it ever was so the idea of having a center that then disperses a grand narrative about what diaspora is no longer can can hold true in this kind of a model uh where people uh where there's a democracy of these communities um it you, you may you, we may argue that it it, it very much challenges that our current moment challenges the 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 notion of a center already so we don't even uh and perhaps it's just left up to uh the the formal institutional structures to catch up with the, with with the moment um in that sense you thought if you were to think of uh one uh question or issue that both congresses would be on the same page what would that be okay good question So the question. The, the question is if I could think of an issue um that both the 1946 Congress um and the 1948 uh conference would be on the same page on um uh what would what would that um um that 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 issue be um because in in my in my sort of uh writing I was I was focusing on this idea of return that holds true for all discussions the congress discussion and the polarized discussion it's just that the place of return varies and the place and time of return varies in each camp um but I would have to I I want to say I can't I can't even come up with one um on the spot I would have to think about that it's a really interesting question Okay in light of what Rafi said something you said that the whole diversity is uh, being part of the bass in the bass bro which makes you sound like high gosh I have in this case <laughs> sorry that was an earlier observation and what up he was saying uh, it seems to me that maybe the centralizing notion might be something we can learn from the kurds to whom i've heard attributed since like short of paper on 30 years ago or whatever he is a kurd who says i'm a kurd i i know what to say i am and then you use that as a defining center and then everything else as long as there's that one defining self asserting connection to the center that becomes the argument for the diaspora or homeland and hopefully western and even homeland as well given some of the openings so self identification we're we're talking the self identification we're we're moving towards what constitutes a, 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 an identity it's the statement uh, that, that i am mhm mhm period mm-hmm. i believe the ultimate objective of all these conferences as the gentleman asked what is the purpose the purpose is preservation of the armenian language now if that is true and if it is and it should be i think having three four different dialects increases the st- statistical probability of preserving the armenian language looking at it from totally you know non literary from a point of say say uh, uh, statistical approach well, isn't that true um I mean, I, 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 think, I think you're saying absolutely the same thing I'm saying just sort of using different terminology. I'm I'm absolutely calling for 
the cultivation of, 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 of the these. two the two linguistic forms and their I mean their dialects. I mean it's it's kind of too late for for you know in the Western you know and and actually a lot of you know dialectical cases. This is not just true of Armenians. It's it's a it's a global phenomenon. But I I I I'm for absolutely the the cultivation. Okay. The other question is if if one of these dialects God forbid, dies or is not used, will it affect in any way another, say, the Eastern Armenian language? Mm -hmm. So now maybe we can tie, I mean, in fact, this is what ties the question of nationalism, the question of identification and belonging to the issue of language. Um, how are we understanding the role of language um, to, uh, in its relation to a group of people? Um, can a people be a people as a collective without their own sort of means of expression their, their, uh, that they call their own? Um, and, and, and to, um, I mean, this is, this is the, 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 the really the power, the role, of, of, of language and the production, literary production, in that particular linguistic form. Um, the question of how will one affect the other, um, um, the demise of a, or, I mean, here I don't, I don't want to uh, get too toward literary theory. There's, there's some really interesting work with regard to that particular question and how we understand language and death of languages, endangerment of languages, or la the, the question of language vitality, vitality itself. Um, I don't want to credit myself for coming up with these concepts, um, but the, the writer Krikor Bolidian, for instance, um, dwells on this topic from the perspective of Western Armenian and its lost dialects. Um, the loss of the Turkish influence on the spoken colloquial and where we are now. Um, and, and in fact, sees vitality from a really interesting perspective. Um, he, um, um, not that a language dies, but it becomes unpeopled, <laughs> the, un, the concept of un je revoute les ou. Um, so so it, more than in one, the demise of one influencing um, the other linguistic form, I think the bigger question is what is at stake with the demise of one linguistic form? And, and I would argue quite a lot. Oh, do you still have a question? Yeah. <clears throat> you talked about the return. Can you explain it in detail? That's one question. The second question is homeland. Is it was it homeland? They were looking at Armenia as homeland, or as the only homeland? Um, so okay, the question of what return really implies. Um, I mean, we're, we're going to have to understand it from the perspective of these discussions because it's too broad of a discussion right, right, to understand it uh, right. more sort of uh, uh, globally. But I think in in these particular in the discussions that are coming out of these two uh, conferences, or at the time specifically, um, the idea of return is multi-tiered. There is, of course, in the 40s, the movement of repatriation. So return is quite a tangible thing to Soviet Armenia. Um, and in the case of the dispersed uh, Armenians, the surviving Armenians, that is a, a, a sort of a, um, it's seen as sort of equated to their lost land. But, but of course, it's not returned to their, their, their land of origin. It's a return to um, the, 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 the new Armenia. Right, the, uh, to Yerevan, to Soviet Armenia. So there's the, the, the real, the tangible. Uh, but there's also, uh, to those who are remaining in diaspora communities, um, the, um, uh, the concept of return is a lot more alive than, of course, it is in our times. Um, um, and um, uh, it can refer to, depending on where your ideological alignment uh, lies, either uh, Soviet Armenia as the new home that we need to construct and build up as a nation, or uh, an, a future imagined greater Armenia that includes.